Hello, it's Dr. Regina, and we are talking about cognitive behavioral therapy today. So we started having a conversation about fears, and I wanted to show what cognitive behavioral therapy really is. And this is a twofer because the way I'm going to present it, we utilize this technique when we're working with people who are neurodiverse, particularly those on the autism spectrum. We use something called ABC charts, but we also use the ABC rubric when we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. What is cognitive behavioral therapy? Well, the C, the cognitive, it's basically focusing on your thoughts. The B, the behavior, is focusing on how the thoughts connect to feelings and that connects to behavior. So I'm going to use an example of going to lunch. The A is the antecedent. The B is the belief or the thought. And the C is the consequence. So if you were going to lunch and I told you that you were going to be about, uh, that the person was going to be about 15 minutes late. So you are there. The situation is you are there. It's 12 o'clock. Person comes in. Um, at 12.15. That's that's what we're thinking, right? But we're now 12.15. The person is 15 minutes late, right? Everyone would and would say, regardless of what you believe about the person or not believe about the person, that person is, as of 12.15, they are late if we said we were going to meet at 12 o'clock. Now, it's 12.15. I'm going to give you the scenario that the person is not there. Now, I'm going to give you three situations. Situation number one, you know that person and they are normally always on time right? So what is your thought? So again, the antecedent, the situation is you're supposed to meet them at 12. It's now 1215. So we would say that they are late. What's the belief? What's your thought? Well, for most folks, they would have a thought. If the person's always on time, probably be something like, oh, are they okay? Is everything all right? And then what would be the feeling? One of the consequences? Well, lots of times people will say, oh, well, I'll call them. Mm, that's not a feeling. The feeling might be that you are concerned or you're worried or um, uh, you're, you're wondering where they are. Now, the other consequence, behavior might be, I'm going to call, I'm going to text them, and then I'm going to ask, are you okay? All right? But more of a concern, are you okay? Now, same situation overall, but what we already know is that this person may always be late, right? 12.15, it's no surprise. So your, your thought might be, uh par for the course. You know, they're always late. I figured they were going to be late. No, no surprise there. But then what's the consequence? The consequence, the feeling might be, um, you know, not shocked, unfazed, maybe even a little irritated because it's like, here they go again. They said they're going to be on time and they weren't. And now they're late. The behavior might be that you call or text, but this time it might not be a full concern. It might be, where are you? Like a little bit of, maybe a little irritated, a little like you're late. Again, where are you? Okay. And then your, your behavior again might be, you might have had an anticipatory behavior. You might have gone ahead and ordered appetizers because you knew they might be late. Um, or you might have gone ahead and ordered your drink because again, you knew they might be late. You only got an hour for lunch and, and you knew they might be late. So you already did those things. So this is one way of looking at this when you're setting up your, 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 your system, your mood log, or if you were doing this for, for autism behavior to see, okay, what transpired, what happened. Now let me give you the third scenario, which is you don't know anything about the person. It's a new kid that's coming to your school, um, a colleague you're meeting for, for, for lunch, and you don't really know anything about their habits. You know, if they are 15 minutes late, then you might be thinking, okay, they're 15 minutes late. I don't know what to expect. I wonder what happened. I wonder if they're running late because they, they're running late from another meeting. Um, I don't know what ant to anticipate. So your belief might be, I don't know what to anticipate about this person. I don't know what to think about this person. Um, did they get caught in another meeting? Did they get caught in traffic? And then your consequence might be emailing them. If you have their uh, number, you might text them. Um, you might call, but you might not call a colleague. You might say, well, let me text them first and see if they're in a meeting they're running behind. Right. Um, but I do anticipate that your response to this person that you don't know might be quite different than your response to the people that you already know. OK, which is really lesson number one in CBT. It's all about experiences. Right. It's about the experience that the person has had already. You know, this person is timely. You have one experience. You know, this person tends to be late. That's another experience. And they all colored how you thought it colored how you felt and it colored your behavior. Right. If you knew this person was normally timely, your thought was more, more, I wonder if that person's OK. And your feeling was more concerned. Right. Or maybe even worried. But the person that you already had the experience where they're always late, your feeling is now maybe a little irritated or a little like unfazed, unshocked, 
you know, this is par for the, your thought is par for the course, but the feeling is, uh, I'm not really phased by this. Um, my feeling, my emotion is unfazed, unconcerned, right? Whereas if it's a colleague, it might be concerned, but a different kind of concern. Like, is this meeting still going on? Thought, but the concern is, you know, I'm concerned for my time. I'm concerned for their time. Do we have to reschedule? That's the thought. So they can kind of mix in and out, but we like to keep them separate in these little compartments here because when you're doing the actual therapy, this is a very simple version, but in every kind of good cognitive therapy, there are two things that happen. I know a person's been through good cognitive therapy if they had homework. Because the homework would be that anytime you have any strong emotion, you're going to do a board like this, right? You might call it a mood log. In a CPT app, you might call it your, your, your challenging beliefs sheet or your ABC worksheet. Where you're going to do something if there's homework. The second thing is, is if the therapist tells me that they are getting you to challenge your thoughts, or if you said that you were asked to challenge your thoughts, usually in good kind of therapy, they're going to ask you three more questions. They're going to ask you for evidence for your thoughts, your beliefs, your behavior, evidence against that thought or that belief and maybe the behavior that you had. And then they're going to ask for an alternative thought. That is what changes your mind. That is how you go through the process of changing your mind, right? Because you're doing something where you're thinking differently. Now, whether you're doing this in therapy, for some people they're using substances or you're using medicines or other things to help get them to a state where they can experience this and, and, and process this accordingly. Bottom line is to changing your mind is changing the way you think. So you came in initially thinking um, this person's late, and you know they're always late and they, this time is no different than any other time and then they come in and they say well actually i was late because i got a phone call that there was death in my family and you know that kind of bothered me that kind of broke it, broke me down for a moment and i'm having difficulties that new information may change the way you think about that person right and so instead of reaming them out when they get there like you're late again the consequence might be i'm offering condolences you're showing empathy right? You're feeling empathetic or sympathy for, for them. Complete, new information completely changes things and it should change the way not only you think, but the alternative thoughts that you create afterwards, okay? So we're going to give a real live example of that in just a moment. Um, and it's going to be the second part because I'm going to do two other things in there, our little, this little mini series. I'm going to give a actually real live example that I've experienced. You might see on our Instagram where we talk about that. And then I'm going to transition over to talking about TMS or Spravato and how to use this when you're going into a new procedure. Okay, so stay tuned for that.